you know, we had met Elvis several times before because of recording sessions, but we really never saw him in action. You know, we never saw him do his his thing on stage. As a matter of fact, a lot of people didn't because he'd been doing movies for so long. Anyway, uh, after the after the first week of rehearsal, just doing the vocals, he, we finally got to go into the next room, which was Elvis Presley and the TCB band and the two vocal groups. And now it started to heat up and things got really exciting and interesting and we could see it all come together. Uh, so we rehearsed with the TCB band with Elvis and Elvis at the time, man, in 1969, he was at his very best. He had been on a, a diet. He weighed about 175 pounds. He had a great tan. He was working out singing and rehearsing with weights around his wrists, weights around his uh, waist, and waist around his, uh, weights around his ankles. And so when he was doing all his movements, he was kind of labored because of these weights. And then when he took them off, man, he was like a racehorse. It was unbelievable to see him, see him work. Um, but anyway, we, uh, we rehearsed for a couple weeks. We were very well prepared for the material but never prepared for the for opening night. The crowd is ready. I mean, they've been waiting in line uh, for days. I mean, honest, the line at the hotel just to get into the showroom, and not everybody could get in. It only held, I think, 2,200 people, you know. It wasn't a huge showroom, but it was the biggest showroom in Las Vegas at the time. Um, and it was, it was sold out. The whole month was already sold out before he even started. Um, every show, 58 shows in a row with no night off, no show, no dark. He sang every night, 58 shows. Anyway, the excitement, but that was from the people. But in the dressing room, you, I mean, Elvis is, he's, he's shaking. I mean, really, he's, he's twitching and shaking and he's nervous and uh, he's reading these telegrams on, on that's the way it is. You can see him reading telegrams and uh, he's drinking hot tea and he's getting ready and make sure his vocal, he's, he's a nervous wreck because he knows now people are telling him, oh, these movie stars are coming in from Los, from Los Angeles, uh, you know, Cary Grant and uh, all these people come to the show to see him. He, he, is, he is so nervous, he, can't, he comes across the hall to our dressing room just to hang out, he said, Guys, this is going to be great, and you know, and he's t trying to make us feel good, and he's a nervous wreck himself, you know. But when he walked out on stage, it, I mean, that was it. He started just walking up and down, prowling the stage, and like I said, it went on for five or six minutes. Nothing, just the band is vamping in the background. The people are going crazy, and the light, the the flash bulbs. Back then we had flash bulbs, you know, you remember those? Where you put a flash bulb and it pops out. They had, the flash bulbs are going off all over. It's, it looked like a strobe light and they just went on for five or six minutes. And finally he grabs the microphone and starts singing and that was it. He was home free. Uh, but he was real nervous up to that point, I can tell you that. You know, something we noticed in Las Vegas uh, was that there were always pretty ladies down around the front of the stage. <laughs> And uh, it was, you know, because we had a real good uh, bird's eye view of what was going on. We were on risers, so we were a little above, and we could see the audience real well. We could see the orchestra, we saw the TCB, but mostly we were focused on Elvis, of course. But whatever happened right along the stage, uh, we, we, we watched, you know, with great intensity every night because there were always some beautiful ladies there. And uh, come to find out that the Mater D's <clears throat> who worked the shows for Elvis made a lot of money <laughs> because these pretty girls would give them hundred dollar bills, you know, for uh, uh, a bribery, really. Get us down front, get us down front. We want to be close to the stage. So um, they would line the stage up. I mean, honest, there were just beautiful women all down in the front. I'm not saying that there weren't husband and wives and you know other people too, but there were always a lot of pretty ladies around stage, and and whenever you know the it was a love song and the mood was just right, um, and the lighting was just right, and Elvis would walk the stage and he would reach down and and uh, they wanted to hand him a rose or hand him a note or whatever, he would always take it from them and then he would lean over and give them a a kiss. Um, it was a it was unbelievable that these. These women came, and some of these women came night after night. I mean, we would see them probably, you know, uh, in a 30-day 30, 30 uh, engagement in Las Vegas, 
you'd see them probably 20 or 30 times. And it was very expensive. You know how expensive it is to just to get into the show. And then plus they had to bribe the, the maitre d' to get them a good seat. And beside that, they just, they, could, they couldn't get enough of it. And, and just for the chance that Elvis might walk by and, and uh, take, uh, take their hand or give them a kiss, it was, uh, it was a special moment. I'm sure that uh, these ladies uh, will re have remembered it their whole lives. And uh, it was great to watch. It was a lot of fun to watch. But uh, uh, Elvis had such an effect when he sang these songs. As I said, he was, the, every one of these women thought, he was singing it to them. It was a, it was a, it was unbelievable how he communicated with his fans. That uh, some of these people came to a lot of the shows. Some some you know, uh, you know a whole week. They took a week off and came from Peoria, Illinois, or wherever to Las Vegas, and they had a week's vacation. Then they came to every show. Uh, but then there was people. There were uh, there were a couple of women that uh, that are even in some of the videos uh, that. Uh, that came to every show. I mean, they were there. And we did two shows a night, so I mean, they saw them 58 times in a month. Um, and there are people now that we see on the road whenever we're out. Now, it's 33 years after his death, and we're out on the road. There are people that um, we see. They've been to Memphis every year since he died, twice a year, in January and in August. They never miss coming to, to Memphis. And these are people that live you know, in uh, Australia or in uh, London, uh, and they come to Memphis every time. They're such devoted fans of Elvis, uh, and um, and everything. I mean, they know everything about him. They know his uh, his new movies, his songs. They know the years. They know his costumes. They know everything about him. They just uh, they're students of Elvis Presley. It's very very impressive, really. When we were shooting for the movie, that's the way it is. Love Me Tender became a, uh, uh, he threw him a curve to tell you the truth. He thought, this is my chance, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> he left the stage and he went down into the audience and walked through the audience and, and, and they were, uh, you know, Elvis never got that close to the people because they were afraid of, you know, the crazy people, the crazy, there's a lot of craziness out there. But they would never let him get that close. He, he was okay if he was on the stage, but never to walk through the audience. But anyway, if you'll notice in the, uh, in the piece, when he's walking through the audience, there's a lot of uh, security and a lot of his guys around him to protect him. Um, but he loved the crowd. They loved to be that close to him. And he connected with the audience in a, in a different way at that point. But if you notice also on tape that he loses his spot in the music a couple of times and we have to catch up with him or he has to catch up with us. Uh, we're trying to keep it going, you know, uh, but it, it, it always was, a, was a, a very interesting to see where he would come in. He would come in at the wrong place and we'd have to catch up or else uh, uh, he'd, he'd listen and finally come in. But the, that was a special song. Love Me Tender became a real special highlight of the show always. Uh, he never would go out in the audience. I think he did on That's the Way It Is for the first time. But he always used that song to communicate better with the audience. It was a special, special song. Yeah, I know we're talking about love songs, and, and, uh, which are obvious. You know, they're love songs to a, from a man to a, a woman, and it's, uh, it's about love and it's about passion. Uh, but Elvis took it further than that. I think um, in his mind, um, there are a lot of ways to express your love. And Elvis was very, very, uh, he, he, he was very, um, when he loved, he loved and in, 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 he was generous. Uh, he was very personal. Uh, if you'll notice, and in, in, uh, in, if you saw that's the way it is, somebody was sick in the, in, in the, in the group, you know, and he came over to the girls and, and knelt down with them and asked about them, how's so-and-so how's doing and how's she feeling and is there anything I can do? Uh, he was so generous and so, um, uh, he had such compassion and feelings for his, if it was a, a, a friend, if it was, uh, you know, one of the family members. Uh, you know how he was with his mother and his dad, how much he loved his mom and his dad. I mean, it was, it was so obvious in uh, everything that he did. But there's something that he did every year that I don't think a lot of people know about. And, I, and he never got any publicity on it because he didn't want it. 
uh, but every year he took $100,000 at Christmas time. 100000 is, you know, a lot of money, but to him it didn't seem like a lot of money, obviously. And he would have like an open house at his house at, at Graceland. And if you came up and had a good story, I mean, he'd write you a check. You know, I need $1,000 for, I mean, he'd write you a check for 1000 bucks. I mean, it would be 1000 or 5000 to 10000 And he gave to a lot of charities in Memphis, you know, to the Boys Club or to the whatever. And he just wrote out checks, a hundred grand every year, and gave gave the money away. And people would, and people knew this, so they would start lining up, and he'd write them a check. It was just unbelievable. And and honestly, nobody knew that. But I mean, this is. Don't you think that's love? I mean, this is love for your fellow man. This is love, compassion, and it's a different kind of love. Uh, but he felt it, and he had it. And he was so generous with us guys. I mean, you can't believe what the gifts he gave us and how much he would come in and he'd hug your neck and show a side of him that you never knew. I mean, he, uh, I gave him a Bible one time and he hugged me and he pushed his forehead against mine. And he said, this means so much to me. He probably had a hundred Bibles, you know? I think that's, that is a part of the love and this love story that, with Elvis that I think is so important. To prove that his, you know, how he cared for people, you know, I'm just, I'm a, I'm a friend, you know, on the periphery, really. Uh, um, but we were, uh, th this thing happened in Las Vegas probably in 1970. Um, we were up in the suite after the second show when we were standing around the piano singing. It was probably three o'clock in the morning. And one of the bodyguards comes up to me. Sonny came up and whispered in my ear and said, your wife is on the phone. I said, well, that's strange, three o'clock in the morning. And but, um, my wife and my family, my children, uh, my four children and my wife were back in a motel that we lived in when we were in Las Vegas, which is way off campus from where Elvis lived in the hotel. Uh, so anyway, it, it, you know, we had a little apartment there and the kids would go out in the summertime and, and enjoy Las Vegas in the summer. And so anyway, they were back in the hotel sleeping. But my wife called and said, uh, you need to come back because uh, our house in Nashville has been broken into. Now, we're in Las Vegas, our house in Nashville has been broken into. She's panicking, imagine that they broke all the windows and stole everything. And so I didn't want to make a big scene because Elvis was there with his friends having a good time. And I told one of the guys, I said, I need to go. So I snuck out of the door and I was standing at the elevator on the 30th floor at the penthouse. And uh, there were two uh, security guards there. And um, I was visiting with them while I was waiting for the elevator. And Elvis comes bursting out of, the, of, his, uh, of his penthouse apartment there and says, Mosqueo, where are you going? I said, I have to go. I was like, I got a little family problem. What's, what's the matter? And by then, everybody that was in, the, <laughs> in there is now out in the hallway, you know? And they're surrounding. And I go, uh, well, I just, you know, I got a little problem. What is it? Well, uh, my house back in Nashville has been broken into and I'm going to go, my wife is crying and upset and so I'm going to go see what's wrong. He said, well, I'm, I'm going with you. He said, we're going to get to the bottom of this. I'm, I'm going to take care of it for you. I said, no, it's okay. Really, Elvis, I, I mean, I got it covered. And, and the guys are panicking, you know, because Elvis now, he's looking for some adventure. And so he starts giving everybody orders. Get the plane ready, we're going to Nashville and get my credentials and get my, you know, and, and everybody get my coat. And so pretty soon everybody's reacting and, and before you know it, we go down, I go down the elevator and there's four white limousines out there and Elvis and all his entourage go in these limousines. I'm driving my little car that I had rented, you know, and I'm leading them and to this little motel. It's, it was embarrassing, I mean, really. And, and so, uh, and, and my wife is in this little motel called the Bally High Motel in Las Vegas, if it could be any worse. Uh, and my kids are in another room sleeping. I thought they were sleeping. So, so we get, they, we go down the alley behind the motel and uh, I showed them the way to go through like this little uh, passageway. And we come around to our place and I knock on the door, my wife answers. She's got her hair in rollers, you know, she's got her bathrobe on and she can't believe that all these people are here. I mean, there's an entourage, there's like 20 people. Um, 
And so we all pile into this little motel room, living room, you know, cheap furniture. And um, I, I go, what? She, she can't believe, she's crying and very upset. Elvis hugs her. And he says, darling, don't worry, I'm here to take care of things. I mean, that's love, that's compassion. And he settles her down, and then he's telling Felton, who lived about a mile from me out there in the country in Franklin, Tennessee, he, call, he said, call the sheriff out there and find out what, what happened, give, give us a report. So, so Felton, this, this was way before cell phones, so you know, he's on the phone, the landline, and he's trying to get the sheriff to find out what happened, give him a report. Meanwhile, the kids hear all this, this ruckus in this room, and they open the door slightly, and they're like stacked up looking out the door from the bedroom at Elvis, and he sees them. He goes in there with them, and I wish you could have seen him that night. It was unbelievable. He had on this leather coat with fur, with fur sleeve, fur cuffs, and a fur collar, and of course his sunglasses and his big belt and a flashlight about three feet long. He had all this, you know, stuff, but he it was Elvis, you know. And the kids saw him, they just couldn't believe it. Well, he saw them and went into their bedroom and sat on the bed with these kids. And uh, he started talking to him. And he said, look, I know, you, you know, we're here because your house in Tennessee has been broken into. And he said, I just want to tell you, if they took your bicycles or any of your toys or anything that you loved and you, you know, that was really your favorite, you let me know, write me a note, let me know. And he said, I'll replace it better than what you had. I promise you that. And okay, and he said, okay. And yeah, they said, okay. And he patted them or whatever. And they, you know, he, he just left them in the bedroom. They, they still talk about it. Now, you know, the kids are in their 40s and 50s and they're still talking about Elvis coming into their bedroom that night. Th to me, that's love. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the real, that's the real deal. And that's what uh, love songs are about. It's about touching people, touching hearts, and making an impression, a lasting, lifelong impression on people. That's a love song. Loving you.